Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Min, and I'm your host for today from NDIS Property Australia. And you're listening to the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides, and brings awareness about all things SDA in this ever-changing NDIS world. Today, we have a special guest speaker from Melbourne, an architect. His name's Henry, with a very unusual surname, so I won't pronounce it. I'll let Henry introduce himself. Henry, introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Min. Great to be here. I'm Henry Skarakas from SGKS Architects from Melbourne, as you said. Tell us more about who you guys are, what you do, and uh, your your entry into the SDA world the last few years with regards to your developments and, and projects. Yeah, sure. So, look, we are a pretty diverse little architecture firm here in Melbourne, second-generation architect, and we work in, in all sorts of areas such as residential, multi-res, mixed-use, retail, and now over the last three years into uh, SDA. So we do anything from, you know, 400-odd apartments up to you know, down to, I should say, single dwellings throughout um, Melbourne and Australia. And we've been working the SEA side for uh, yeah, yeah, approximately three years now and collaborating with some great people in the industry and helping our clients navigate many of the, uh, the pain points of SDA. Pain points, that's an unusual word to use. <laughs> please elaborate what that means, please. Oh, look, there's, there's a lot of pain points in anything now in, in development and construction. Anything from planning to to just you know construction costs, but we are very aware that SDA has a different set of rocks, as we call them, and um, just just all the the red tape, getting the right teams together, getting the correct information to be able to deliver the right product, and also kind of I guess avoiding some of the cowboys that are also in the industry. Oh, another unusual word. What's a cowboy mean? <laughs> oh, look, I don't want to offend anyone, but there are. There's lots of different um, people trying to, you know, deliver different types of SDA. But um, as time goes on, you know, like in any market, the the buyer is getting more educated, and there's certain product that probably doesn't do as well as it used to. Now that the the area is, um, you know, growing and becoming, um, oh, how do I say, maturing, and uh, there are still people trying to deliver product that maybe is a bit outdated and trying to get on sell that, and and also try and get people on board for certain projects that really just don't really work anymore with the, with the current climate. Gotcha. So you're the new sheriff in town trying to get rid of all the cowboys then, right? No, <laughs> not at all. I think every every, uh, every town needs a cowboy. But um, look, just, just um, look, we, we, we're, we're very happy with where, sit, where, where we are sitting in the, um, in the design space, but that's also only because we're working with, with great people, great partners in, in providers and still providers to then also educate us so we work, yeah, collaboratively as a group to to achieve the best result for our clients and also, you know, social impact and, and, and the best product for, for participants as well. So you specialise in multi-res, a lot of SDA apartments in the marketplace for Melbourne. What makes a good project in terms of SDA apartments? I mean, describe the internals, externals, the, the amenities. What have you seen out there that, whether it's your jobs or, or other people's jobs, what have you seen out there that actually looks and feels right for the community look it also depends on lots of factors there it depends on location obviously is is number one and as we say rolling distance to a certain level of amenity so that people don't have to go too far to be able to live a a good life and feel part of the community as well so we have seen some products that maybe don't have the greatest of rolling distance therefore aren't as attractive to the educated buyer or, or renter and therefore those projects sometimes fail sadly and then then you know you're left with more tenancy vacancy risk i should say so but good projects are um location is number one we are finding some people like to, to salt and pepper you know 10 to 15 within the bigger projects and there are other people that prefer to have a standalone you know eight pack or six pack as we call it but as we know we don't know the end user until later in the project so it is quite speculative and there is element of risk 
but um, just providing a really good level of amenity uh, internally and in common spaces for the participants is really key now, a real point of difference. And also blending them in with other retail, other commercial, and also other tenants as well. So that's a part of a, a community. One of, my, um, one of my contacts asked me this morning, and I said I'll ask you, is the apartments that you're working on, are they all class three with fire sprinklers? Or, and or is there ever a class one apartment for SDA? That's a great question. We're going through that today as well because, um, as you know, I mean, we're delivering our first finished product this week, uh, 15 apartments within a, a larger project of around 40 apartments. Now, depending on the building surveyor, depending on the scale of the project as well, it can change the class, but the building surveyor is the one that does, does make that call. And some building surveyors are looking at it quite differently. So I think it depends on the scale of the project can um, determine the class as well. You didn't give me an answer, really. <laughs> let, let me rephrase it. Uh, a lot of people, being participants, providers, families, and promoters of this product, would agree that in a, in a multi-res building, obviously it's hard to get out, obviously. So you would assume, obviously, you would assume that there'll be fire sprinklers in all these um, apartments. But that's just an assumption based upon, as you say, the building surveyor. But the, the common sense approach says, well, why would you build a a block of units or apartments in one six pack or eight pack or even a high rise without fire sprinklers whereby they can't get out and or it's put in danger. That that's common sense, I guess. Yeah. That's why, right. why would it, why would a building surveyor say my question is why would a building surveyor say, no, you don't need fire sprinklers in a um, high rise apartment for um well, look, so, some of these, as we call them, um say a six pack might have four on the bottom and two on the top and therefore you can start to to look at different types of egress and, and, and fire access as well. But look, there is such things. We put sprinklers in all of our projects to date. And touching on just touching on the, the point that is what complies versus what is also good design and common sense, as you says. Now we always try and push good design. So one issue I think with the with the industry is that certain products comply, but they don't make sense. There's no common sense and um it's not great for the participants. So what we try and do and educate people is that, yes, you can make a product that um, can get ticked off and can comply, but the reality is you've got to have a point of difference and, and good design doesn't always mean compliance. It means taking it to the next level and, and creating a better product than, than um, just ticking the box. So to answer your question, we have put sprinklers in all of our projects and we push that. Some of the smaller ones, I believe you may be able to get away without, but as you said, with an educated buyer these days, there's no reason why you wouldn't. And also, you do get a little bit of extra um, rental return if you have sprinklers in the building. Gotcha. So, the Preston project you're looking at at the moment will be fire sprinklers in Class 3 then? Definitely. Definitely. That's right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. My next question is, what are the areas around Melbourne that you are working on for pipeline product for SDA projects? Yeah. So, being more in the multi-res and, and apartment projects, it does start to limit where we can sit. So, we look at residential growth zones, mainly mixed-use zones, all within satellite cities and, and activity centres throughout Victoria. Now, generally, they're around stations, train stations, supermarkets, retail areas, some commercial hubs as well. And we do that because they're close to a good amenity of public transport and, as we say, rolling distance to a whole range of amenity for the participants. So some of the projects we have, people are bringing to us and then some projects we're also scouting for different people in the industry through mandates that, that they require. So so you've mentioned to me in the past, Thomas Town, Preston. What other areas around Melbourne are you reviewing at the moment or pipelining? Yeah, so what we're doing is we're following we're essentially following train lines down to different areas. And so we're going east, southeast, uh, north. So at the moment we're also looking in um in Baronia and those sort of areas, so that sort of south, southeast, also down into Frankston. As we do know, if, if it's a developer-driven project, then the land cost component is a huge portion of the project. So if you can get out to those other residential growth zones, which are on some of the other train lines through the south, as I said, Thomas Town again, in the north is a great one, all the way out to sort of almost back as much. You can go west as well. Sunshine's a great one where you can still get decent land prices in growth zones without going crazy, and you have that ability to do high density. So some of these areas you can quite easily do six, seven, eight levels and you can pepper in SDA or you can get smaller sites on the peripheral of the growth zone and you know do your do your standalone eight or ten as well. So 
again, we look at anything that's within sort of 800 metres to a kilometre of, um, of a train line, and that's sort of where we start. But we are also getting asked now to look at sites further out because people do need other product as well. And it's uh, as long as it's near a bus line or a disability tram line as well. But we are finding, yeah, we're doing quite a few in Baronia at the moment, which is a great spot. To our listeners out there who are listening, uh, if you're a developer or investor looking at in getting into more of a project's um, capacity, um, obviously there's more to just having a train line as a, a, as a, as a, as a um, criteria, obviously, uh, you know. <laughs> Um, look at government infrastructure spend. I mean, I know in Sunshine there's a big amount of money being spent for the, uh, by the government in that local area there. I was with there in Sunshine with your colleague, um, Frank, about three weeks ago, and I loved the walking around with him, understanding the marketplace there, and him telling me that there's definitely more capacity for development there in the area for there. So government spend, tra- um, amenities, hospitals, medical centres, um, train lines, that's the first, I guess, vetting criteria that you would have to consider as an investor or a developer yourself. But then also looking at the SDA data. Henry, do you actually explore the data yourself at all or do you rely upon external consultants to talk to you about data demand? Yeah, look, we do rely on our relationships with our providers and our SIL providers because we have been told by more than one or two people that the data isn't always too up-to-date or accurate, but um, I'd love for someone to tell me otherwise. Um, but we do use the data for sure. But sadly, apparently, it's not always accurate and conflicting with, with the live data, really. So the other side to that is that, you know, if we can get in with a provider and talk with a SIL provider that either, you know, have a demand in certain areas. And the other side to that coin is that if uh, areas are already flooded or there's other things in the pipeline, there's a few areas we looked at that we earmarked a great site for a client. Uh, he came to us with a site. We said it could be possible. And then we found out, even though there was a demand in that area, there's two others that had permits. So then you've got to start thinking, all right, if you want to go, you've got to go quickly and you've got to be first in. So they're the kind of things. But we are trying to work on MOUs now with some SIL providers to, to really shore up their interests and get a bit of a accountability in the project early on to show that they are interested and get something in writing rather than just speculate and sort of uh, and uh, see how you go. And that element of risk hopefully starts to um, come down a little bit. Gotcha. Do you ever work with providers in creating accessible product which is not SDA compliant? We haven't. No, everything we're doing is SDA. I mean, we do obviously standard residential, but no, everything we're doing is uh, SDA in this space. Mm. The reason why I ask is because there's definitely demand for it. SDA is only 6% of the marketplace at best, and the other 94% have been neglected. Uh, or should I say, not everyone who's in a wheelchair is qualified for SDA funding. So. They're being left out in the dark there at the moment and be good for more developers and investors out there who you know, may not want to invest in SDA but wants to contribute to the community and think about specially designed custom bespoke designs in a project apartment complex to have it more flexible for, for those people who are still disabled and are in wheelchairs but do not qualify for SDA. That, that's all. And also, as you can you also explain to our listeners, uh, Henry, the density compliance requirements for a site, how that works. I mean, I, I thought, originally, I thought it was 10% of a, of a complex, no more than 15. But can you explain those numbers as has those, how the NDIA mandate those, those calculations of, as to densities, please? Yeah, look, we were under the same impression for a while, but we've had uh, people more educated than us tell us that the, currently it's, it's up to 15 in, in one project with one address. So if you only have 15 apartments, you can do 15. But if you have 100 apartments, it's still only 15. Uh, 15 also require two OOA studios. Don't have to be full apartments, but studios. So, you know, you're sort of up to the number of 17 as a maximum, any one project. Now, obviously, you can come down from that, but we have seen a couple of projects that are almost clustered and, and almost have two separate buildings, although they're linked and with two separate entries that sometimes can then put in another 15 if there is um, Sort of two, they're, they're technically one building, but if you can get two addresses to the building and, and sort of separate, there are ways to get more in there. But again, you, you know, then it comes down to market and, and demand as well. Can you also, I don't know the answer to this question, but can you also explain to our listeners why the concierge model of 10 and 1 is the, the benchmark, but 15 and 2 is more ideal rather than 15 and 1? So why is there a 2 away for 15 and not 15 plus 1, please? So we've found there's a few reasons for that. Well, one being that, you know, some people that are high physical support. So we generally design everything to cater for high physical support. And 
knowing that not everyone in each apartment will require high physical support, but the floor plans are quite similar to fully accessible. So it's more just about adding a few extra provisions to, to give the developer or the owner the opportunity to potentially earn a li- little bit more and, and then also have the opportunity to have different types of tenants in. But the thing with high physical support is that some people have, you know, a dozen, a dozen or more touch points per day. So therefore, they, they don't have one carer. They might have two carers or they might have three carers. And then when the carers do handover as well, then there's more and more carers. So you, you do need quite a bit of space and, and um, amenity for the carers because it's not always just one carer using that unit to, to sort of do what they need to do in it. So anything over 10, if you're up to 11, you need two OOA apartments. So anything between 11 and 15, you need two. But yeah, anything up to up to 10 you, for compliance, you just need the one. So I think, it, I think it does come down to the amount of carers that will then be servicing those 10 or 15 and also the number of carers as well. Gotcha. A point that's been very contentious in the marketplace with lending the last six months or so has been the ownership of the OOA in a concierge model, be it 10 and 1 or 15 and 2. The concern by the lenders are what happens if someone sells off the OOA apartment, the one bedroom apartment, and then makes the whole complex of, of SDAs negligible because to qualify for SDA funding, you have to have the, the on-site concierge um, OOA office. In your projects that you work on, do you wrap up or modify the bylaws or strata rules to ensure that the OOA, what well, example, unless all owners of all the, of the apartments of SDA on the site approve of the sale of the OOA, it cannot be sold, and or all the apartment owners actually own a, a one-tenth of the OOA. Are you seeing that? Are you talking about that kind of um, concept with your developers and investors? Yeah, we, we definitely are. We sort of plant the seed for them, but then... Um... We do lead on their legal team to help navigate that. So we essentially just, you know, let them know that no matter what, the OOA studio or apartment needs to be linked to the rest and it's never, never going to be separated. So they've got a few options, but we certainly just, you know, let them know from the early days that it, it's not a separate apartment. It, it does have value. And as you've, you've, you know, shown us, Min, as well, it does have value to that, that unit, but it has to be uh, attached. So look, I think, I think. The simplest way is for all all apartments to own, you know, ten percent of it or fifteen percent. But we we do yeah we do leave it up to uh, the legal team and we just keep drawing the pretty pictures. Gotcha, I understand. So apart from apartments, do you do standalone dwellings, duplexes, and villas in the marketplace? We do, we do. we uh, we did a couple again because because the, the the industry here and the market in in Melbourne. You're still kind of uh, in the early early days. We've done a lot of concepts. We've done thirty odd concepts for thirty odd projects. They're all starting to get legs now. So yeah, we, we do duplexes, we do villas. We're doing a few at the moment. There's sort of four villas in a row. The, the tricky one in in Victoria is this: land prices have just gone through the roof. So to get villas to stack up can be tricky. But we are hearing now from sill providers and and providers that they're open to having villas further away from. A certain level of amenity so that you can get that lower land price because there is such a demand that there's demand for all sorts of product right you know anything from more expensive apartments in more expensive areas to to the outer areas of um of melbourne as well so we are doing all sorts we're doing as i said the pepper model standalone villas duplexes yeah it's really taking off we're doing them here and also in, in perth and, and queensland as well for the benefit of our listeners what does a villa look like? Is it one build, building with separate walls to show four units under one roof line, or is it four separate buildings on a site? What is a villa? Tell me. Yeah, well, that's that's a good thing because we don't use the term villa in in Melbourne. I'd never used it until um, I started dealing with people from from Queensland. So we're finding you can you can do either. It depends on the site. You can almost do row housing villa as long as the site uh, lends itself to that and. Also, the site constraints, planning overlays, it all has everything to do with it and access to cars and where the cars are parked relative to the villa. So the good thing about separating villas is you can use the separation to park cars or outdoor area as well. So it is very site-specific. So what do you call it if it's not called a villa? Oh, here we call it a townhouse. Oh. Yeah. And it's quite rare for people to build single-level townhouses now in Melbourne. You just don't really see them. They did them a lot between the 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s as well, sort of the red brick or the brown brick, single, single level. But now just with land costs and, and, you know, obviously demand for housing, everybody goes up because that's, you know, same land value per, per 
townhouse or villa, but you get more amenity because you go up. So the single level model obviously is coming back in because of SDA, but then it all comes down to to the land component and um, the value of the land, and and that's where that's where it's that's where sometimes it just doesn't work here, sadly. Speaking of going up, would you build a double story house with a lift inside it to enable separation of um, of, of people living in the house, wheelchair access with the lift? Would, have you done any and would you do it? Definitely. Where we, We've only done concepts. We haven't delivered anything. There's no reason why not. As long as the, the lift is of the right size as well. And then it all, you know, it all comes down to feasibility. So the ones we were doing with a lift was more for someone that has employed us that themselves has a disability rather than a, a developer coming to us and saying, this is what we're going to speculate. This is what we're going to deliver because it is a, a much more expensive product. And in some of the areas where you can get a two-story villa with a lift, they end up d- defaulting to apartments because the, the you know efficiencies and economies of, of that model and also the apartments getting a high level of funding really per square meter as well. So the only ones we've done are, are for independent people that are building their own product. Gotcha. Yeah. Wonderful. Henry, any uh, final words of advice for any listeners who want to – engage an architecture firm like yourself to do uh, individualized concept drawings for a block of land for a, for a dwelling versus uh, someone who may own a larger block of land who, are, who, are, who may be considering getting to a four-pack, six-pack apartment complex. What's, what's your advice before they, they come to you um, to, to engage? Look, we, we get a lot of calls now, cold calls, and, and the hardest thing is hearing, I guess, people that... Um, like in any industry, any industry, a little bit greedy and, and have an expectation about what it is going to be and how quickly it's going to be. With some people liken it to the childcare craze that went on and is still sort of going on. But the thing is, you don't get a commercial lease with a stack of apartments. That that's the that's probably the trickiest thing. We, we're not really seeing head leases as much anymore, and a lot of developers are calling saying, you know. I want a head lease of X amount and I want it guaranteed and I want a commercial lease and then the tenancy pays all the outgoings. People just need to understand that it is 10 or 15 individual uh, residential leases rather than a commercial lease. So it is a very different model and there are a lot of hoops to jump through and it is a slow process and you don't know who your tenants are generally until later in the piece. So if you're building to retain and rent, there is a level of you know tenancy risk as well. But it is a great social impact project, a great way to go down, and it also can really underpin projects. You know, we've we've stitched in again ten into other projects that maybe were going to fall over or or not quite get off the get off the mark. But then there's a level of con- confidence in the project because they sort of either pre-sell or look to almost pre-lease ten. So it can be a great way to to again do something good, good for the social impact and also underpin a project, but. All I would say is get ready for a fairly slow process. Planning, especially in Melbourne, is very slow. They're trying to change that around care and maybe speed up that process. I would just say, yeah, vet a few consultants. Like we we enjoy it. We think we're good at what we do, but also there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of people out there. Work with someone you can work with and, and don't just do something just for compliance. Do something with a point of difference so that your product stands out to people looking for a good product. Wonderful words, Henry. <laughs> If, uh, if anyone's contact you, Henry, how can they contact your organisation, please? I'll look at uh, phone or email, uh, best email being info at sgksarch.com. Our web- website has a bunch of uh, projects on it, selection of it, not all of our SDA, but it has a portion, and that is just sgksarch.com. And on there you can find our contact details or look us up or give us a call and... Um, Come in for a coffee and we can discuss the project needs. No worries. Well, um, for our listeners, if you're uh, looking to meet Henry, you can also meet him at some of the conference events that are happening around Australia. You've been invited to a few little conferences and expos and, and seminars. What locations are they uh, happening in? Look, they're happening all over. We're, we're going to be doing some of the workshops and the conferences in, in Perth, in Melbourne, at this stage Sydney and also Brisbane. Sadly, we can't make the Adelaide and Tasmania, but um, at the moment, it's those dates throughout March, April and May, I believe. Yep, wonderful. Well, um, if anyone wants to know more about the services of Henry, please contact him directly on the website or otherwise call our office. We'll definitely be attending some of those events as well. We'll promote them, those events on our um, social pages as well. 
Henry, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. We look forward to working with you in more detail with more up and coming projects that you are rolling out around Melbourne with our client base and our investors, developers and builders as well. And uh, we hope that uh, our listeners have really enjoyed uh, understanding more of what goes in the uh, background of creating a product for SDA in the Melbourne market. Thank you so much, mate. Pleasure. Thank you, Min. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.